The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, Happy Days, a sleepy seaside town with a population of 1,300. It's only major crime, an attempted bank robbery back in the 1990s. Hazel? But on March 12th, 2012, a crime is committed that is so horrific, it shakes the community right to the bone. <coughs> this special, we got a homicide. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Nestled in the rocky shorelines of the East Coast, Happy Days is an idyllic seaside town known for its world-class seafood chowder. This tight-knit community prides itself as being a real get-to-know-you kind of place. Hazel is an 80-year-old widow who lives with her 17-year-old cat, Minou. She loves mystery novels, Needlepoint, her weekly game of Pinochle, and Port. Brenda is a volunteer who delivers meals to the elderly, like Hazel. Concerned for Hazel's well-being, Brenda calls 911 to report a possible break-in. Hello, police. Most criminals aren't professionals, so they look for the path of least resistance. They tend to prey on the weak. And an elderly woman like Hazel, who's frail and partially blind, is a perfect target. Hello? Hazel? Anybody home? Hello? Hazel? Hazel's body has been bludgeoned repeatedly, a deep cavity cut through her chest, and her heart removed. If my years at the FBI have taught me anything, this might be a ritualistic killing. What the murderer did to Hazel, though, goes well beyond what's needed to simply kill somebody. This was what we call overkill, and it was executed for a very dark and twisted purpose. Investigators go over the crime scene with a fine-toothed comb. and discover that the broken glass from the window has the top of a footprint left behind. On a different piece of broken glass, the investigators identify dried blood. The intruder may have cut themselves on the way in through the window. It looks like a lip print. So somebody drank the blood from the pan. Thirsty much? My guess is that it wasn't the victim. This is further evidence that it was a ritual killing. And I'm pretty sure we're dealing with a seriously twisted whack job who's into a lot more than just Dungeons and Dragons. The blood evidence is sent for testing. 
If forensics can identify the DNA from the blood, it may lead them to Hazel's killer. The footprint left behind is processed in the hopes of finding a match for the shoe. For a small town community like Happy Days, a murder like this is nothing short of shocking. I mean, this is the stuff ripped straight from a Hollywood horror film. The good people of Happy Days' biggest worries are usually bike theft and petty vandalism. But a gruesome ritual killing of a sweet little 80-year-old woman, that's scary stuff. And the local police need to be careful about releasing the details of the murder. First, they don't want to create panic, but second, only the murderer will know the details, and they don't want to blow their case. The forensics team identify the specific pair of shoe based on the unique pattern, a size 10 running shoe, and once the DNA results from the crime scene are processed, they reveal a key piece of information. While the majority of the blood from the scene is Hazel's, the blood found on the broken piece of glass from the back window belongs to a male. The investigators now have two big time leads. They know the make of the shoe and they know they're looking for a male. Now, Happy Days has a population of 1,300, so that narrows down the focus and makes it a little easier than, so, let's say, New York City. The killer also is more likely not an elderly citizen based on the physical power they exercise over Hazel. But with a ritual killing like this, motivation is much more difficult to identify, and creating an accurate profile of the killer is far more important than in your typical murder case. The police have identified the blood found at the scene as male and a footprint belonging to a specific brand of sneaker. Armed with these key pieces of evidence, they begin to search for the killer. The local police have never dealt with a major crime, much less a ritualistic murder. So a behavioral psychologist is brought in to help create a profile of the killer. Behavioral psychologists bring a deeper understanding of the human psyche to cases like this. And that's exactly what we need here, because we're not dealing with your run-of-the-mill, gun-toting murderer. We're dealing with someone who removed a human heart and drank the blood. And while I'm no profiler, that tells me we're dealing with someone with a pretty extreme, well, let's just say, imagination. The behavioral psychologist concludes that the person they're looking for has a strong interest in the occult and witchcraft. They're also more than likely a loner, withdrawn and private. Armed with a profile that they're looking for a male loner with an interest in the occult who was wearing a size 10 running shoe, police launch a manhunt. They canvass the town and surrounding area, retrieving DNA samples from every male between the ages of 18 to 65. The good people of Happy Days are only too happy to help the investigators out. With a vicious killer on the loose, people are living in a state of fear. And the sooner the police can catch this killer, the sooner they can sleep easy. Five days after Hazel's murder, the usually sleepy town of Happy Days is rocked by another shocking death. A fishmonger named Glenn sets himself on fire and jumps from the top of a lighthouse. The police learn from Glenn's girlfriend that he suffered from bouts of depression that sometimes resulted in violent outbursts. The media jumps all over the story, going as far as suggesting that Glenn killed Hazel and was so torn up with guilt that he killed himself. Turns out, the lighthouse where Glenn committed suicide is only a few miles away from where Hazel lived, which gives police cause to search his home. They find a suicide note and a passage from the Bible that references a heart. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. 
So an old woman has her heart cut out and there's this guy whose suicide note specifically references the heart. Well, if that isn't a coincidence, then I don't know what is. Police collect all of Glenn's shoes to see if any of them are a match with the footprint found at the crime scene. Shoe prints can act like fingerprints. With running shoes, there's a specific pattern to each and every sole. And in a small town where less shoes are sold, this can really narrow a search. Plus, when shoes are worn down or scarred or cut, they create a specific pattern on the sole unique to each person's instep and walking style. If they can match the sole of one of Glenn's shoes to the footprint found at the crime scene, then bam, they found their man. But none of Glenn's shoes match the print found at the scene. They extract DNA from Glenn's burnt body in the hopes of making a connection. But no evidence is found, and the DNA doesn't match. The search of his home didn't yield a weapon or anything else tying him to Hazel's murder. Even though it's frustrating for both the local police and the people of Happy Days, Glenn is eliminated as a suspect. Sure, it would have been great if we could have pinned the murder on him, but that wouldn't have stopped the killings. And law enforcement, things are rarely that cut and dry. It's back to the drawing board for the good guys. And with no other suspects, the investigators are gonna have to start thinking way out of the box. Investigators are running out of time and strategies. Police refocus their investigation on who could have purchased the specific type of running shoe that the killer wore. There's only one store within 50 miles that sells this brand of running shoe worn by the killer. Roughly 57 pairs of that shoe were ever sold in the store. Police track the purchasers through the debit and credit sales. They question everyone who purchased a size 10 shoe and take DNA samples. But all of the alibis check out and none of the DNA is a match with what they found at the crime scene. Detective James cannot catch a break. Every lead is a dead end. This is when you look into your little investigator's toolbox and use whatever you've got that might help you break a case. With no options left, the police decide to reveal the grisly details of the crime to the media in an effort to stir up more leads. The media can be a great tool. You'd be surprised how many people know things that they don't realize are actually significant leads. Like, let's say, knowing a guy with an overly active interest in vampires. A French au pair named Margot comes forward and tells the investigators about an incident a few months prior. His name is Alex. Alex? Yeah. <laughs> Margot met Alex at a party. <laughs> they got to talking about a shared love of vampire fiction. I mean, what if you could be one? Mm. Like a vampire, right? Like you that would be amazing. You'd do it, right? He started going on and on that happy days would be the perfect place for vampires to live because with so many old people, They'd have tons of easy victims to feed on. Okay, and then what happened after that? He just wanted me to bite him in the neck. You can bite my neck? Maybe uh, that, just to get things started? No. <laughs> he just kept saying, just one bite, just one bite. No, no, I'm not going to bite your neck. He started begging her to bite him. Just no, no, hey, get off me, you freak! But Alex just wouldn't take no for an answer. Just one bite? Oh, come on. Let me get this straight. There's a, there's a local kid who is obsessed with vampires. He thinks that Happy Days is the perfect hunting ground because they can prey on the elderly and drink their blood. Then he gets so excited that he tries to force the girl to bite his neck. OK, then. And he tried to make me bite his neck. Margot called the police but she ultimately decided not to press charges. Friends. 
When Margot saw the news report of an elderly woman who had been stabbed, her heart removed and blood drained, she figured she should speak with authorities. So it's pretty clear that Detective James and her team need to track down this vampire-obsessed kid and stat. He's the best lead they've got by a country mile. Alex is 18, loves all things vampire, and wants to be an animator when he grows up. He had a regular childhood, but four years ago, his world was torn apart when his mother died of breast cancer. Alex was terribly affected and had difficulty accepting the tragedy of his mother's death. Alex retreats into his own fantasy world of vampires. He imagines himself as a romantic incubus capable of drinking human blood and living for eternity amongst his fellow vamps. On the heels of Margot's story, the police question Alex. How well would you say that you know the victim, Hazel? I don't know anyone called Hazel. Uh, Alex, Hazel's property was one of the few in the neighborhood where you mowed the lawn. Alex's father reminds him that he's been there as recently as a couple of weeks before the murder. That's right, I forgot. So you do know the victim? Yeah. Sorry about that. It's of significant interest that Alex knew the victim and had access to her. In layman's terms, that's what we call opportunity. Police request to see all of the shoes that Alex owns. The investigators hit pay dirt when they uncover the same type and brand of running shoe that was worn by the killer. Let's get forensics on this. So see how this is worn right here, and it's worn in the exact same spot right there. When the soles of Alex's sneakers are compared against the print found at the crime scene, they're an exact match. The investigators have an arrest, which in this case is a massive step forward. But what they really need is concrete evidence connecting Alex to Hazel's murder. And time is running out. And here's the rub. They only have 48 hours to find that evidence, or the kid walks free. Got to find something, or we got to let him go, so. When investigators search Alex's room, they find sketchbooks filled with dark, beastly images that indicate an obsession with vampires and the occult that goes far beyond the ordinary. On his computer, they find links to pages about drinking blood and black mass. Then, police finally hit the mother load. What? They find a vampire figurine with dried blood all over it it's immediately sent to forensics for DNA testing. Alex's obsession is a serious red flag. You think, this is an unhealthy mind at work, but here's the thing. While the drawings and search histories are incriminating and really pretty cheesy, if we're being honest, it's all still just circumstantial evidence. The investigators need more to put him away. They need a smoking gun. The DNA found on the figurine belongs to Hazel. And Alex's DNA swab taken after his arrest matches the DNA found on the broken window at the scene of the crime. I love the grind of good old fashioned police work. You canvass the neighborhood and talk to each and every person. You're looking for something, anything. Sometimes you don't know what it is, but you don't stop. You turn over every stone you can, and then, boom, you get a lead like Margos, and the case suddenly has legs. Now the question turns to how did Alex do it? Alex waited patiently outside Hazel's home the night he came to kill her. He knows that Hazel lives alone 
because he mows her lawn. And he knows she has a habit of listening to the radio very loudly. Alex pulls Hazel's unconscious body to the floor. Then he starts on the grim task of getting what he came for. An old lady's heart. I'm gonna live forever. was a perfectly normal kid with a clean record. So how'd he get to the place where he could kill a little old lady? Ultimately, I just don't think he could accept his mother's unexpected death. I mean, suddenly the world of vampires and immortality speaks to him. Maybe he just didn't want to die himself. Or maybe he was angry and wanted revenge. Alex is charged with the murder of Hazel a mere half hour before they would have had to release him. He's found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. For some, the line between fantasy and reality can be razor thin. That line is called sanity. An otherwise well-adjusted kid couldn't deal with the trauma of his mother's death, so he tried to create a fantasy world that would let him escape. But it didn't work. Vampires aren't real, and if you drink somebody's blood, hey, you're not gonna live forever. Alex had to learn the hard way that nobody escapes reality. Nobody. The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, wealthy expats Adam and Talia are living the beautiful life. But when cracks start to appear in their picture-perfect marriage, things get very ugly. Police will have to sift through a mass of secrets and lies. What are you doing? To unearth the foul truth. Dubai, ultra modern, ultra rich, and ultra crowded. There are over two million people with a big community of expats living the high life. Expat communities are strange places. You've got professionals that make a nice living in the West, but then you get someplace like Dubai and you're launched into a whole nother stratosphere. Fancy digs, fancy schools, lots of servants. On the surface, it looks like the beautiful life but a lot of money doesn't mean bad things can't happen. I'm just so worried he's been gone for two days. This is what he looks like. How long have you been married? 10 years. Canadian expat Talia's rich engineer husband, Adam, has been missing for two days. They met over a decade ago on winter break while they were both poor grad students. So then <laughs> I was coming down <laughs> and this girl, boom, right into me. Adam is immediately attracted to this outgoing and feisty girl. 
while Talia is impressed with Adam's smarts and ambition. They get married soon after they meet and move into Adam's tiny student apartment. While he studies for his master's in engineering, Talia drops out of grad school and works two jobs to support them. Like the saying goes, behind every successful man is a woman. Talia is giving up her own dreams of becoming an architect and pinning them on her husband's future. Romantic? Well, maybe. Sacrifices are all well and good, but as time goes by, resentments can rear their ugly head. My advice? Consider a prenup. Upon graduation, Adam lands a job at a world-class engineering firm, and they can finally stop living like poor students. They're able to buy their first house and start a family. Hi. How are my girls? Oh, she's doing so great. Oh, bye. <laughs> I love you we'll guys. We'll see you soon. All love right. you too. Take care. Bye. Adam works his way up and is eventually headhunted by a rival firm who transfer him to Dubai. Here, he's overseeing massive construction projects. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. Once in Dubai, Adam and Talia are launched into a completely different world than they've ever known before. Adam's salary is extravagant, and they live in a luxury apartment complex. Talia's daily life is now a whirlwind of spa treatments, expensive lunches, and shopping sprees. I know what you're thinking. Nothing wrong with success and money. I get it. But a whole lot of money all of a sudden has a way of bringing out the worst in people. Some deal with newfound wealth by spending it like it's going out of style, while others become obsessed with holding on to it. After a few years, Adam becomes a senior executive. His salary doubles, but so does his workload, meaning he spends less and less time at home with his wife and child. So he's a workaholic and she's a shopaholic. Sounds like a perfect match, huh? But it's a slippery slope. Talia isn't getting what she needs from her hubby, so she's looking for a way to feel better. And there's nothing like the rush of retail therapy. And Adam's so obsessed with success that he's letting his entire family down. It is bound to come to a head sooner or later. Things haven't been good for a while. He's just working so much, and things just started getting kind of rough. Rough? What do you mean? Talia tells the police that she and Adam were having troubles. He was drinking more heavily. Hey. But more disturbing was that he had become more and more controlling. <sighs> Talia, I warned you. What? Look at this credit card bill. It's atrocious. What am I supposed to do? You're gone all the time. Oh, nice. I'm sick of it. You know what? I'm done. No, no, I'm done with you. The last time they were together, they had an argument about money, and Adam became violent. Talia claims her husband left after he assaulted her. She thought he went out to cool off, but he never came home. Do you want to press charges? No. Just find him. Police look into Adam's disappearance. They find out that Adam hasn't been to work on site for two days. Colleagues are aware that he and Talia have been experiencing marital problems and wonder if Adam moved out. But when police check hotels, he's nowhere to be found. They check all the local hospitals, but there's no sign of Adam. They also discover he hasn't used his credit card in a few days, and there's no evidence that he's left the country. It's possible Adam doesn't want to be found, and he's covered his trail. He's rich enough to do that. But you also have got to look at the person's patterns of behavior. This is a guy who practically lives at work, and if he's not there, you got to consider he might have met with foul play. So where do you start looking? You start where he was last seen. Police question Adam and Talia's maid about her whereabouts on the night Adam disappeared. Well, it was actually my night off, so I wasn't working. Um, I spent the night at a friend's house. And is there anything strange you noticed a day or two before he disappeared? Um, no, nothing, nothing too strange. It's a dead end. The detective also questions employees at Adam and Talia's apartment complex, but no one has seen Adam. 
While in the utility room, the detective catches a whiff of something suspicious. Inside the room, he's hit with the overpowering smell of something rotting. During investigations in the FBI, I've been in some stinky situations, literally. Nothing like going through a sewage drain or a garbage dumpster to make your day. We used to call those trash covers. I can't say you get used to it, but it's part of the job. Talk about following your nose. This could have been just rotting garbage. But as an investigator, when something's off, you check it out. And this was not a waste of time. From the decomposition, I'd say Adam has been dead for at least a few days. Right around the time his wife said she last saw him. Now the police have found Adam's body. They need to find out how it got in the utility room. According to the maintenance logs, the day shift workers brought the box down to the utility room four days before. Bro, what are you doing, man? It's heavy, it's heavy. It's heavy. Let's go, let's go, man. Detective Abdullah learns that Tally is the one who asked to store something in the utility room. Tally has claimed that Adam assaulted her and disappeared after a fight is now in question. She goes from frantic wife to prime suspect in his death. When police search Talia and Adam's apartment, they find traces of blood in the bedroom. Hiding evidence in plain sight? Not very smart. Talia's had plenty of time to get rid of it and clean up. But what would she tell the hired help? And heaven forbid that she would clean up after herself. Money does change people, huh? It would appear that Talia was involved in Adam's death. But what exactly happened? That's the million dollar question. I did it. Talia admits to killing Adam. He was hurting me all the time. You have to believe me. I was scared. But she claims it was in self-defense. I was scared to tell the police. She didn't tell police the entire story before. She says Adam had been abusing her for years. Domestic abuse has nothing to do with status. Rich or poor, it can happen in any relationship. An abused woman can be really great at covering up the state of their violent marriage, so even people close to them are unaware of it. Talia tells police that on the outside, their marriage looked happy. But in reality, it was all a sham. According to Talia, Adam was consumed with his job and never home. When he was around, he was abusing alcohol. I thought you stopped drinking. Really? This again? You need to stop. Or else what? You need to stop. It's for your own good. You can't tell me what to do. But I can tell you. He was getting worse, and she was worried sick for her kid and herself. Tell you. What is this? Do you have what? any idea how much money you're spending? She says that he was fixated on money and monitored her spending to the cent. I warned you. Oh. And one night, he went berserk. What are you doing? Adam, what are you doing? She says that when Adam chased her with the golf club, she had no choice but to defend herself. But the box. I don't remember the box. I don't remember. Not remembering what you did after a traumatic event isn't unusual. Dissociative amnesia is a known stress response for victims of abuse. The brain literally shuts out what it can't handle. You always want to give the alleged victim of abuse the benefit of the doubt. But right now, we only have Talia's word against that of a dead man. Police need to figure out if it all adds up. Police learn that Talia is the sole beneficiary of her husband's $20 million estate. They're married with a kid, so it's no surprise she's his heir. 
But is that motive enough for murder? I mean, why not just divorce him and get her half? But for an abuse victim, leaving your husband is not always easy, especially if there's a kid involved. But if this is actually premeditated murder, all I can say is Talia, she's playing the long game. She has to convince everyone that she was the real victim. When they go through Adam's accounts, police learn that he'd installed spyware to track Talia's emails and spending and hired a private investigator who's dug up some pretty damning evidence. A guy has to be pretty controlling and paranoid to spy on his wife and have her followed. So Talia's claim of being a victim, well, that's looking good, but she's having an affair, which doesn't look so good. But it's not unusual for an unhappy spouse to go looking outside the marriage for attention they're craving. The lover may not be a new designer purse, but he's something. Police need to find Loverboy and figure out whether or not he's involved in Adam's unfortunate demise. Police go through Talia's cell phone records and learn that her lover's name is Brody, but he's no local. He lives in Canada. They met during Talia's regular trip back with the kid to escape the suffocating summer heat of Dubai. Wow, thank you very much. I'm gonna try these on. Yeah. Wow, I love them. Good, I'm so wow, glad. thank you very much. No surprise, he loved them. But who wouldn't love $1,500 designer sunglasses and a rich girlfriend who's starving for a little bit of affection? And the bonus? The husband is halfway around the world. Sounds like a perfect setup. Only Adam's no regular husband. According to the PI, Adam was infuriated to find out his wife was having an affair and lavishing him with expensive gifts. He sets out to take care of the situation. Honey, please, we can fix this. No, no, we've tried. We've come so far. I'm a changed person. Please give us another shot for the family. Smooth move, Romeo. If Adam is an abusive husband, this is a classic ploy. Ask for forgiveness, kiss and make up, but it's all a control thing. Let's see how long the honeymoon period lasts. Adam and Talia go to counseling and work on their marriage. Adam promises to be a better husband and father, and Talia promises to cut ties with her lover. I've got work still. But soon, Adam is back to his old workaholic ways. And Talia turns back to Brody for comfort. So Adam never removed the spyware from his wife's devices, and she never severed ties with Brody. There is not a whole lot of trust going on here. And you know what they say, once you lose trust in a marriage, things are gonna get ugly. So was it murder for money and a new life with Brody? Or was it self-defense? We have two versions of events. So how do we cut through the secrets and lies and get to the truth? Well, there's this handy tool called science. The autopsy reveals that Adam was stabbed eight times. Each wound was deep enough to kill him. It shows that he was lying down when attacked. The autopsy also reveals extremely high levels of sedatives in Adam's body when he died, and a green liquid in his stomach. Now this shoots Talia's claim that Adam attacked her right out of the water. The maid was out for the night, so Talia was alone with Adam. It's likely that she drugged him and bam, cleaned his clock for real. So while fingers point to Talia as her husband's killer, the cops still need to make it stick. And for that, they need to trace the drugs back to the loving wife. 
When forensics sweeps Talia's personal laptop, they find some suspicious internet searches. Toxicology report. How do you explain that? I don't know what this is. Internet search history. Drugs? Overdoses? What about that? When she's questioned about her search history for drugs, Talia breaks down. I told you what I had to deal with. These are mine. They're my pills. Talia tells police she was so despondent about her marriage and the abuse that she contemplated taking her own life with prescription pills. Even though the evidence is looking more and more damning, Talia's got a plausible explanation for everything. Abused wife or black widow? That's the $64,000 question. With Talia sticking to her plausible story of self-defense, the police are stuck. But then, police catch an unexpected break when the maid comes into the station. So what do you have for me? Uh, well, Mr. Adam and Mrs. Talia, they were having marital problems, but Mr. Adam was never abusive, though, never violent. Now knowing her employer's deceased and not simply missing, she volunteers more information on what she saw days before the murder. Adam was filing for divorce, but his lawyer accidentally had the draft documents sent to their home. This came for you. found out about the divorce, she was quite upset. Okay then, that lawyer has some splaining to do. No secret that divorce brings out the worst in people. Conscious uncoupling is a fairy tale. Resentments flare up and people do extreme things to get back at each other. She sacrificed for him and now that he's at the top of the ladder, he's leaving her behind. And she's one desperate housewife. Shannon tells police that after drinking his regular kale chia seed smoothie that Talia insisted on preparing that day, Adam became so tired and woozy that he had to take a nap. Talia had Shannon serve her hubby a smoothie laced with enough drugs to fell an elephant. Guess what kind of person would poison their husband? Well, one that's dead set on winning the breakup, that's who. I did love you. Apparently, Talia called Loverboy 30 times the next day just to hear his voice. She might have used her time more productively and concocted a more foolproof alibi. Shannon tells the cops her employers had arguments, but Adam never abused anyone. Based on the maid's additional information, police arrest Talia. She's later convicted of murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. According to his PI, Adam suspected that his wife might have been trying to poison him for months. But when the PI urged him to get tested, he said he felt guilty about his suspicions. He didn't think Talia was capable of such a thing. So what did we learn? Try not to take the people you love for granted because you never know what someone is capable of, even your nearest and dearest. And kale chia smoothies aren't always as healthy as they look.